Today is September 2nd, 2015. The title of tonight's sermon is going to be Get Up. Everybody say, Get Up. Get up. I don't know if you noticed it, but tonight, um, my distinct feel when we got here, and, and please don't take the next part of this as me fussing at all, it was 6.45 and there were about five of us in here for prayer. By the way, prayer on Sunday night starts, I mean on Wednesday night starts at 6.45. And so 6.45 to 7.15 we pray. I know everybody's coming from work. I'm not even asking. I'm just looking and going, ah, there's five of us. This is great. And then I know that others, as, as people came, we're all, you know, it's kind of weird. Do you fellowship? Do you pray? We're trying to get our stuff together. We're trying to get in here. And it just, a little, little foggy, right? And this, this phrase just kept, kept going over and over in my mind. Let's get up. Let's, let's do this. You heard that throughout the service, throughout the worship time, it really felt kind of a, <laughs> kind of a crescendo. It kind of just kept growing. And, and Lord, we hear what you're saying. I hope to just share with you for a few minutes tonight, and then I want to get back into worship. It's time for us to get up. It's been a very hard summer for some of us. It's been a very hard season as a church. There's a lot going on. We've got new babies. Uh, we're going to pray for Riley before we get done tonight. Uh, Riley's going in for a special procedure tomorrow, an MRI and some different things where they're going to actually have to anesthetize her. I can't say that word very well. I should have just said go to sleep. And, uh, but they're gonna, they're gonna, there are some procedures that have to go on tomorrow, so we're going to lay hands on Riley and we're going to pray because that's what we do. As we were all fighting a very difficult uh, battle with Steve, with Dee Dee, we, as a church, are standing there with our feet flat on the ground looking at death and saying, we're not afraid of you. There's nothing about death that we need to be afraid of. And we prayed some pretty bold prayers. And I know that Eric addressed some of this on Sunday during our um, celebration service. But there's some of it that I wanted to address again tonight. One of the things that actually Pastor Eric mentioned it, I think on Saturday night, we were over at the Stevens home and we were preparing for the next day. So all the pastors were there, and we were just talking about it. And Eric had relayed a story about a, a funeral service that they went to, and, and the minister at that funeral service got up and said, hey, I know that many of you have a lot of questions, but today is not a day for questions. Well, I, I understand where he was probably trying to go with that. But as, um, as a minister here at this church, I went, yeah, that's not how we roll. We're not going to dodge any question. We're not going to run away from anything. We're going to actually just stand there and say, perhaps God can speak to us and illuminate it, even if we don't understand it. Amen? Uh, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. For those of you who are in the class, I am picking this passage because it's been the passage that's been most uh, speaking to me over the past few days and few weeks. It has been the one that is engaging my heart the most that I can't seem to get away from. And so this is why our primary text tonight comes from this passage. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, and, and pardon me while I reference the class again, the first 12 or 15 verses or so are Nathan rebuking David. And we talked about this in class last week. What an incredible way, what a brilliant way to present truth that Nathan did to David. Uh, so, King, perhaps there were, what would happen, you know, what do you think about two men? Let's say two shepherds. And he lays out this entire story, and David gets fighting mad about the story. And then the punchline, the hook is that Nathan says, Oh, great King, you are this man. Wow. It, it drops on King David like a, like a ton of bricks. It hits him and impacts him in a way that is incredible. Right after this story, as it's transitioning out, let's look in verse 15. So 2 Samuel Chapter 12, verse 15. Say there when you're there. Yeah. Amen. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. I don't want any comfort in this time. I am serious about my prayers towards God, is the attitude that King David had. Verse 17, the elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground. <laughs> They're coming alongside of him. I can tuck him under an arm and say, come on, come on, king, let's rise up. He would not allow that to be the case. 
But he refused and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, everybody say the seventh day. The child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. Can you imagine? Let, let's take a moment and understand this scene. For seven days, David is fasting and literally laying on the ground in anguish, crying out to God, weeping before him, weeping before the Lord until there are no more tears left to weep. The servants realize that the child has died and they're like, goodness gracious, if this is the despair before death comes, what in the world might the king do to himself if we tell him that the child is dead? They were afraid that he might harm himself. They were afraid that there was something desperate that would happen. Verse 19, David noticed that his servants were whispering. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I struggle often to try to figure out the right words. I'm a pretty slow writer. When I, when I write something, I'm very slow because I, I think about every word and it takes me a while and I revise it, and then I revise it again, then I have to revise it again. Some of you guys are kind of, you amaze me because you get there much quicker than I do. But <laughs> I can imagine that these servants, they're whispering off to the side and saying, we've got to find the right way to say this. Like, what are we supposed to do? And they're wrestling and amongst themselves and this is what happens. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves <laughs> and he realized the child is dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Sometimes we're looking for the right words and the, and the fact is, is there are no particularly right words, it's just the truth. It's just we come straight forward with the truth. Then I want you to look at verse 20. There, there are a few things that happen here and I want to encourage us with the word tonight. Verse 20 says, Then David got up. Everybody say, got up. got up. From the ground. After he had washed. In the NIV it says, put on lotions here. Does anybody have another translation? This is family, right? Does anybody have a different translation tonight? He anointed himself, Gabriel says. That's actually a much more accurate word there. When I think of put on lotions, I think of... Right? I'm like, huh, put on lotions. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> if you're from Louisiana, you might ask, is that, did he get ashy? You know, you got, got to get, put some lotion on. Some th sometimes those things are needed. But the word really there is he anointed himself. He actually anointed himself. Hmm. And changed his clothes. If I say changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord. He went into the Bait Yahweh and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food and he ate. So again, let's, let's keep this in context of the story. He was distraught because this child was sick. He wept, he fasted, he prayed with all of his heart. They announced to him that the child is dead. He gets up, he washes himself, he anoints himself. He changes his clothes. He goes to the house of the Lord. He worships. He goes to his house and he eats food. Even socially, what he did was very, very strange and perplexing to the people that were there. Just a few minutes ago, just a verse or so ago, they were worried about him harming himself when they told him the news. When we, when we read the scripture, sometimes we read it too quickly. Sometimes we kind of blow past some of these things and like, put yourself here. You are worried about your friend who's in despair, who's fighting with all they have. And then at the moment that you think it's going to be the worst, something happens and it, it has he lost it? <laughs> what's going on? Did, did he have a little snap in his brain and he, he's not connecting? Does he understand what's going on? Verse 21, his servants asked him, why are you acting this way? Wouldn't it have been customary for him to mourn then? Wouldn't it have been customary for, for at least days on end, perhaps a month, perhaps 70 days, perhaps whatever it was, there should have been time of mourning, and yet it seems like he's missing the boat. The servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, 
But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. This is a very perplexing matter. He answered, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? Everybody say, who knows? Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. What is David talking about there? Is he not referencing directly his faith in the resurrection? Is he not saying, guys, I know it looks like I've completely lost my mind. I I understand that. But I've got a hope in the resurrection that makes this different. How is it that as a church we can stand and pray such bold prayers? And if you're not really kind of into it or if you've never been around this, um, what I've seen people do is that they will pray bold prayers and then it doesn't work out the way that they think. David didn't get the healing here. So what they start doing is praying things like this. And please allow me to explain it before you throw rocks at me. They start praying God's will only. And, and, I, and I mean this in a religious kind of way. Like they don't want to make a commitment either direction. They don't want to actually hear from the Lord and find out His will. So they pray, well, the Lord's will. Why? So they can be insulated from any responsibility or any boldness that they may have to do and say, no, we're going to pray for life. No, we're going to pray for healing. No, we're not afraid to go ahead and pray this. Perhaps, perhaps the Lord, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to us and some type of miracle will happen. But what happens is if we get in this religious kind of praying God's will, and by the way, obviously I'm not against praying for God's will, right? (laughs) Let his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth. So you guys understand that I'm not saying this, but what we have to be careful of is we have to actually get up in our thinking. We actually have to get up in our boldness. We actually have to get up in our lives and be able to pray things and go after it. We're a church that's good at going after things. Amen? Amen. That's why we're here. If you're here, if you've been here for a while, the reason that you stay here is because we like going after it. We're not going to back down from things. But I want you to see right here, (laughs) we're going to go after it and we're going to be okay with the answer that God gives us. For those of you who didn't catch it on Sunday or if you weren't here or if you didn't hear, I believe that our bold prayers as a church actually caused resurrection life to come into DD last Sunday. Sorry, Sunday before. Ten days ago. There was an actual resurrection that took place. (laughs) An actual resurrection. She died for about eight to ten minutes. Am I underestimating that? Almost twelve minutes. Okay, I was underestimating. Almost 12 minutes without oxygen. And the king of all creation brought life where there was death. If you miss that as a church, it's harder for us to get up in our thinking. It's harder for us to be encouraged in this time. In that moment that God causes resurrection power to come into our friend, could he have not made her six foot four and bulletproof in that moment? What other power in the universe would have had to been present to do anything? Is cancer too hard in that moment? No, it's not. Is there any disease? Is there any sickness that could stand before our great king? Of course not. So we pray for life and we saw a resurrection from the dead. And we now have a friend who's standing beside the king. If you think that that's going to keep me from praying more bold prayers, it's not going to discourage me. It's actually going to cause me to pray more fervently. It's going to cause me to go harder after God and say, perhaps we can see another resurrection, Lord. Perhaps (laughs) there are churches who have canes and, and, and things of people who have been healed. And amen. I want to be amongst people who are just going to go after it with all of their heart. Who are going to get up Time after time, day after day, we're going to rise up and do what it says here. Looking back in verse 20, it says this. He got up. We have to get up in our thinking. We have to get up from where we are. Ever had those mornings that it's just really hard to get out of bed? Get up! I had one of those mornings today. I was like, I can't open my eyes. I was kind of awake, but I just, it was just difficult. 
get up. Where have you been? Have you been staying too long in one place in your thinking? Have we allowed any excuses in any of our lives? Are we allowing excuses to keep us down? Get up. Turn to, uh, keep your place here in 2 Samuel because I'm going to come back to it several times. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. Say there when you are there. Good job, Julia. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 22. The hand of the Lord was upon me there. And he said to me, get up and go out to the plain. Isn't that basically part of, this, part of the message of the entire gospel? Get up and go. Get up and go. How many times did, he say, did God say basically something like that to someone, to the nation of Israel, to one of his people? Get up and go. What was the last things that, that Jesus said on earth? Get up and go. Right? The hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Get up and go out to the plain, and there I will speak to you. Sometimes God isn't moving enough in our lives because we're just not getting up. We're just not going towards what he has for us. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22 and starting in verse 14. Acts twenty two fourteen 14 says this, Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on His name. Get up. What areas in our lives do we need to get up? Do we need to change our perspective? Um, in a very simplistic example, my wife and I have been blessed. We just moved, I guess it's been almost a month and a half ago, into a new house. And, and here's what we do in our house. I, I've heard this said a few times, and I'm kind of, kind of ranting about this in my own home. Oh, y'all live way out there. Way out there. We live in Katy. <laughs> Bethany's like, we live way out there too, right? <laughs> We're not allowed to say that in my home. We don't live way out there. We happen to live exactly where God Almighty placed us. It's pretty obvious that he placed us there. I enjoy the fact that God placed me in the specific house that he placed me in. It's not way out there. We've got people who, who drove in every weekend from Round Rock, Texas. About 180 miles, roughly, something like that, every Sunday. I think I can drive in from Katy. I think it's going to be okay. I think I'll be all right. I know some of you drive from a lot further than we do. But, but I started hearing that in, in kind of in my home. Oh, it's way out there. So are you not happy with what God has done in us? or So it takes us a few more minutes than what it did before. We're going to just go ahead and get up in our thinking. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and rise up and go, it's right around the corner. God could have put us twice as far. He could have put us in another city and told us to come here. And you know what we'd have done? We'd have done it. And probably not complained about it as much as moving to Katy. <laughs> oh, amen. No, we got to get up. And I know that's a real simple. I know it's a real simple thought. And I'm not just espousing the power of positive thinking here. I'm trying to get us to change our perspective on things what difficulties do we have? This is part of the Christian walk. We're just going to keep moving forward. We're going to keep a joyful attitude in this. We're going to rise up. We're going to get up. We're going to wash our face. We're going to anoint, our, our, we're going to anoint ourselves with oil. David anointed himself. Put that in your theological pipe and smoke it, right? He anointed himself. Well, I don't know if... About, I don't know if in other words, I actually, <laughs> Lord, I have a good enough relationship with you, even if I need to lay hands on myself and pray for myself to get <laughs> better. I'm just going to lay hands on myself and get better. Like, 
Brother Baj is an elder, so I guess he can, the elders can lay hands on themselves and anoint with oil and right? pray the prayer of faith. And, hey, but we, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? What excuse are we going to allow to keep us from doing what God's calling us to do? What obstacle are we, going to, are we going to allow to stay there instead of just getting up? Just wash yourself. Cleanse yourself from the worldly way of thinking. When I, used to be a, uh, when I was a, a teacher and a band director, one of the things that I hated, uh, hated doing was when we had district band director meetings. Because we would go to these district band director meetings and it was nothing but complaining all day long about what they couldn't do and their struggles and what, how bad their principal was and how stupid their kids were. And I was like, that's not me. I don't want to be like you people. I don't fit in with you people because that's not how I'm going to be. I'm not oblivious to what reality is in front of me and I'm choosing to keep a joyful, thankful heart and a thankful attitude about everything that's before me. I didn't fit in and actually it's the thing that caused me to... St- <laughs> it, I stood out in, in both senses of the word. I, I, wa- I wasn't like them, but they saw the difference. That's the very thing. If I would have gotten in the mud with them, I have no witness. I'm saying, hey, well, you know what? God has really placed me in a great school. Sure, we have some difficulties, but I know that God's with me. These weren't saved people. This was just district people. Huh. Anoint yourself. <laughs> Get under the anointing. Hey Amen. Hadn't that been a theme, a running theme that we've been having for the last several weeks? Are you hungry for the Lord? Do you want the Lord? How hungry are you for Him? How hungry and diligent are you seeking out the, the Holy Spirit to be at work in your life? I need His Spirit to be there because I need the anointing. I am not worth anything without the anointing. I need His anointing in my life. I desperately need it. You know what? Anytime that I think that I don't, I realize that I'm deceiving myself and go back, Lord, I desperately need Your anointing. I I can't even handle the few things there on my day unless I have You with me. That was a revelation that got a few years ago. I had to-do lists that I realized that I could do all by myself. I like to-do lists. I'm that guy. I'm that nerdly that I like crossing things off the to-do list. I will add things that I've already done onto my list so that I can cross them off. (laughs) If you're not a to-do list person, you don't understand what I just said. If you're a to-do list person, you know you do it. Every day. Oh, I did that. I'm putting it on the list and crossing it off. (laughs) Boom! Boom! but I realized that I had to-do lists that were filled with things that I could accomplish without actually having to be a believer, have the power of the Holy Spirit in me to do anything supernatural. Those are bad to-do lists, ladies and gentlemen. If everything that I need to do today, I can accomplish in my own strength, perhaps I'm not really synced up with the Lord. Perhaps I haven't risen up. Perhaps I haven't washed myself and anointed myself and then changed clothes. Turn to John chapter 11. I hope this is making sense to you. All right now, youth are, youth are smoking in here. This is good. How about you adults? You guys there? Yeah. Excellent. Way to represent. John chapter 11, let's start in verse 17. This is the story of Lazarus. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Customary to leave people in the tomb. They had kind of a watch thing for how many days? About three days. Just in case the person wasn't actually gone. Right? He was in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Amen. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet Him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I love Martha's answer because it's probably the same type of answer that I would have given. I know He will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I understand that at some point, far off in the future, Lord, we will get to see Lazarus again. Hey Amen. That's, that's pretty faithful, actually. shows that she understood the Word and 
understood what was going on, but not the fullness of what Jesus was trying to do in this moment. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You're talking about the resurrection, and he's saying, you're looking at the resurrection. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Where else do you need to go? What else do you need to do? Because I'm standing right here. We know the rest of this story as it goes along, but can you, can you just for a minute think about it? She's saying, hey, I know one day. He's saying, for you, dear, it's today. There's a difference when Jesus is in our midst. There's a difference when He is here with us, when we are relying on His Spirit, when He walks in and says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am what you need. I need more peace in my life. You need more Jesus because He's the Prince of Peace. I, oh, my life. You need more Jesus because He's the resurrection. I need, you need more Jesus. You need more of His Spirit at work in you so that you can accomplish what He has for you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is one of those chapters in the Bible that I absolutely love. And I'm trying to stay very channeled in what I do and not do this entire chapter because I love it. (laughs) If you haven't spent time studying 1 Corinthians 15 in your life, let me encourage you to do that. It is talking about the resurrection. It is the hope of Christianity. If there's no resurrection, then we're to be pitied. If there's no actual resurrection power at work anywhere, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then we should be pitied. We're pitiful without the power of the resurrection. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then we then when he comes, those who belong to him. Verse twenty six The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under Him, it is clear that this does not include God Himself who put everything under Christ. When He has done this, then the Son Himself will be made subject to Him who put everything under Him so that God may be all in all. Take a look at verse 50. Because if I don't skip to 50, I will read 28 through 50. So let's skip to verse 50. It says this, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Just can't be done. You can't get a godly result by doing it in a worldly way. Never. Never is that going to be... The God of all creation will not allow that to take place. Regardless of what it looks like on the outside, He will not let flesh and blood inherit the kingdom. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery... Isn't that a great... Don't you just want to lean in? If you're actually reading this or hearing this for the first time, you you got something that you want to tell me? This is a secretive thing? This is a mystery? You're about to lay something on me? I got my pen out. I'm ready to listen now, right? Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, (laughs) at the last shofar, For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Everybody say changed. Changed. Don't you just need to be changed in your life? I understand that this is talking globally and we're talking about the end of all things and and resurrection. I need need the same resurrection power at work in me every day. There are things that I need to be changed from, and it's not going to be because I try hard enough. It's not going to be because I'm good enough and can achieve something. It's going to be because I let His power be at work in me because the same change that's there, I need in me every day. I need Him to to reform, to transform, to undo, to redo. Whatever it is, I need His changing power to be at work in me. 
For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. This should build hope in your heart. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Think about this phrase with where we are on the timeline. Where, O death, is your victory? (laughs) When I think of Didi, I think of the people of God hearing the word of God and praying the will of God for her health. You think death won? (laughs) Really? You think death won? Death, where is your victory? So our friend is whole, healed, eternally in the presence of God? You think you won? Of course we wanted her here longer. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? (laughs) You can't prick my heart with that kind of loss, with a hopeless kind of feeling, because I am hopeful. I don't, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord has spoken a word, can death separate it from happening? (laughs) How many things did God promise to Abraham that we have yet to see fulfilled in its entirety? You think death can stop God's word from succeeding? What what amount of time can stop God from doing what he's promised that he's going to do in your life? Is, Is there anything too big for our God? What is it that you need him to do in you? What is it that you need God to change in you? It always seems like it's going to be impossible until it happens, right? You pray for something and it feels like it's too long in coming until it comes and then the time that you've waited almost seems like it vanishes, like a woman in in labor. There's excruciating pain and then at that moment, what happens? A joy unspeakable and full of glory floods them. It was all worth it because (laughs) the promised child is here. Therefore, my brother, stand firm. Therefore, my friends here in this room, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. I am intimidated personally by words like fully. Because fully is a pretty uh, complete word there. It means I have to give 100% I cannot hold anything back from this. And we've talked about it before. Isn't that our nature as human beings? We always want to hold back just a little something in case it doesn't work out. We want to pray a little bit of a softer prayer just in case that it doesn't work out. And then then how do we look? What are people going to say? What are we going to think? Um, I've determined in my life that's not going to be the thing that keeps me from praying bold prayers. I look like a fool all the day long. Because I I know if I pray bold prayers, perhaps the Lord will come in and do something incredible. Perhaps He'll do much more than what I've asked or even thought about. Perhaps my faith is what it can move the Creator of of all. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. How are you doing in giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord? Are you allowing your work life to get in the way of giving yourself fully to the Lord? Are you allowing your home life to keep you from fully giving yourself to the work of the Lord? Are you allowing comfort in the fact that you need to relax after a long day? Are we allowing distractions? I mean, let's be real in our world. How much time can we spend on Facebook? How much time does it take you in the morning before you reach over 
and start flipping through something on your phone. Nope. Right, the baby's the only one talking right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cricket. You know, there was a study that was done, and the time to device for the average American is less than five seconds. Wake up in the morning, grab some type of tablet, some type of phone, some type of TV, some type of something electronic to start thinking for us, to start doing something for us, to get us informed about the world around us. I don't have a particular inclination. I'm not saying Facebook is of the devil. I'm also saying it's not from God. <laughs> I'm saying, are you giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord? Are you allowing your past to keep you from fully giving yourself to the Lord? What excuses are you allowing to keep you from giving, from, to keep you from giving yourselves fully to the work of the Lord? I have to reevaluate this every single day. Lord, am I really giving you my all? Or am I giving you less than my best and calling it my all? Am I giving you what I'm just willing to give you and calling that everything that I have? Because when I give you everything, I am exhausted. I am spent. I have nothing left. And his strength made, is made perfect in my weakness. And he speaks to me. And he allows his spirit to be with me to do more and accomplish more. I'm nothing, but I want to give him my everything. I want to empty myself before him because I desperately need him to fill me. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, when you read through Hebrews 11 and you start seeing a small list of those of the great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by, when you think about those that have gone before us and laid the groundwork, who have fought their fight, they've run their race, they've finished their course, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. But I feel all alone. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. But I have to sometimes anoint myself. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Everything that hinders and the sin. You mean there's things that can hinder that may not be classified as sin? Everything that hinders and the sin. Both categories are we obliged to look at, to get up from, wash ourselves, anoint ourselves, and go to the house of the Lord and worship. We are obliged to take care of both of these things. Why? Because we're surrounded by people who've done it. It is not impossible because we have that resurrection power at work in us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, <laughs> a new bride who has her eyes fixed on her husband and he walks in as he walks in a room. A groom who has his eyes fixed on his bride coming down the aisle. When I saw Christy come down the aisle, it literally took my breath away. Literally. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I've done wedding, weddings for people. The last one that I did was in Austin. I think it's the last one I did. And the, the, he's a state trooper who guards our governor. He works in the state capitol, and he blubbered when he saw his beautiful bride. 
it took him and it, he almost hyperventilated right next to me. I love that. What, what, a, what an awesome thing. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. Have you ever thought about why it says joy there? Out of all the words, out of any language that could have been chosen, for the joy set before him. It doesn't say for the obligation. It doesn't say for the duty. It doesn't say for the command. It doesn't say, it says for the joy set before him. <laughs> Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy? What areas in our life do we need to actually allow the joy of Christ to be at work in us? The joy of the Lord is our... You feeling a little weak? You feeling a little anemic? Maybe we need to allow the joy that's regardless of our circumstances that are around us, we choose to say, Lord, if you can set for the joy set before you, you endured everything that you endured. We'll finish up here in 2 Samuel. Turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 20, then David got up from the ground. He washed, after he had washed, anointed himself and changed his clothes. <laughs> isn't, that what it, isn't that the end of the story in Lazarus? Jesus calls and says, Lazarus, come forth. And what does he do? Lazarus comes forth. And Jesus looks at the people around him and says, take off his grave clothes. He's alive now, but there's some things that he needs to get unbound from. He needs to change some of those ways and some of the things that he's been doing. It's got to still change even though there's life. After you wash, put on anointing and change his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house. And at his request, they served him his food and he ate. We are in the house of the Lord tonight. We're just going to close in worship.